it becomes paramount to bring in ethics, economics, environmental considerations into the core design of engineering. See, good science is peer-reviewed, but accountable engineering is reality refereed. Hello, I'm Sue Nelson, and welcome to the Create the Future podcast, brought to you by the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering, celebrating engineering visionaries and inspiring creative minds. Guru Madhavan is a senior director of programs at the National Academy of Engineering in the United States, where he focuses on engineering practice, communication and policy. He grew up in a rural area near Chennai in India, but after taking a degree in systems engineering at the University of Madras, he travelled to New York to do a master's and PhD in biomedical engineering. He has awards for innovation engineering sciences and education, and is also known for his books, especially Applied Minds, How Engineers Think. Vince Cerf, a former winner of the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering, no less, described it as offering a compelling explanation of the engineering perspective. So I began with that perspective and asked Guru how engineers think. There is no uniform approach to how engineers think because the varieties of creations and the consequences attached with engineering are just so different and cosmopolitan. That took me on this entertaining narrative journey, part self-exploration, part professional exploration. I came down to basically three essential attributes that characterize engineering mindset. The first relates to bringing structure where there is none. And this is a fairly uniform habit of the engineering mind. How do you operate in an environment where there are too many variables and considerations? And how do you organize? How do you bring order to the approach is something that relates to structure application in a context. The second element is the invariable scenario for operating under constraints. And even if there are no constraints, engineers, good engineers, know how to apply constraints to fuel their creativity. After all, we are limited by physical laws and human behavior and policy constraints. So this is a a unique characteristic of engineering design approaches. The third aspect is to make judicious trade-offs. In life, not everyone can have everything. Engineering design is also that way. You package them all together, the structure and the constraints and the trade-offs, what I call the one, two, three punch of the engineering mindset, basically provides an architecture uh, for how engineers think. And why did you want to write a book about that? Part of uh, the motivation was to really understand uh, how engineering, which is arguably one of the oldest cultural practices, perhaps even created for survival instinct, the art, the philosophy, know-how, which is far more ancient than the sciences of know what. Being such a consequential profession, I really was motivated to understand what drives the engineering sensibility and its willingness to contribute to society at large, deal with relentless failures, yet produce accountability in practice. How do you do that? And uh, being such a human activity, that really motivated me to explore the foundational question, how do engineers think? And that's what got me going on that journey. Is it something you think that's innate or is it a way of thinking that can be taught and learned. It is readily trainable. And I think uh, uh, if you even look at the origins of civilization, some of the ways of thinking that we now take for granted must have sounded foreign, unnatural. So these are the trained attributes. One can diligently put one's mindset in different circumstances and get better at those If you look at some of the most successful engineering companies, they take this kind of learning and unlearning quite seriously. That is a precondition for success in engineering. Do you think engineers are misunderstood if people don't have a similar mindset? 
I don't want to live in a world where everyone thought like an engineer, even though the work that we do is consequential. But I think an element of cognitive diversity is of utmost importance. And I think engineering sensibilities have a fair amount to offer to the social structures around us and to make better sense of the world in terms of enabling better sciences and also simultaneously to consider not just the technology possibilities, but also fruitfully integrate the behavioral and the policy dimensions, which are becoming increasingly more challenging in the the complex systems that we have created for ourselves. By understanding the element of um, the engineering mindset and all the possibilities uh, and the unwarranted consequences attached to engineering design, we can be better consumers and uh, creators of engineering. Engineers often use the word creative to describe their job, but that's not often the first profession that comes to mind if you use the word creative. Do you think artists and engineers have more in common than they realise? Engineering was originally known as uh, one of the profound practical arts. Even the term engineer, the modern context, goes back to the 11th century, I believe, much before the word scientist was invented, which was uh, in the 1830s. So there is a level of history here that we need to be cognizant of. And also the kind of the task order, so to speak, that the society has given engineering and then the contract that exists between what engineers create and how society consumes them and the vice versa. Now, I think we have a much better opportunity to really step back and uh, having been through the technological developments, we can now ask the question, how do we bring engineering fruitfully into some of our civic processes? And at the same time, also bring some of the civic consciousness into the world of engineering. So there's a bilateral benefit and we can better marry them to get better benefits out of engineering going forward. Because no other profession gets to the scale in terms of creation and consequences as engineering. Is this why you've advocated that so-called hard sciences, such as engineering, could benefit from more engagement with the humanities and arts? Absolutely. And uh, that is something we are getting uh, even more active uh, in terms of articulating at the National Academy of Engineering. In fact, uh, the next five years, the strategic themes of our work at the National Academy of Engineering that relates to people, systems, and culture. Merely focusing on engineering to serve the people, systems, and culture is not enough. We need to now focus equally importantly on the people, systems, and culture of engineering so that the profession itself can become more inclusive, more appealing to the widest range of thinkers, including especially artists and uh, humanists, who can contribute uh, widely to the professional development. You brought the person, the sort of humanity aspect to fore in your book, and it seems like that's very deliberate. Do you want people to associate engineering with people, with its impact on the world? One of the cultural tendencies we have created to achieve certain things to the benefit of society. How do you go about understanding the anatomy and physiology of the problem sets that we deal with? And there's much to be learned from how different human beings approach them. And in this case, uh, they all happen to be engineers. For example, Alfred Hitchcock had a completely different approach than uh, the French engineers who built their guns to achieve better efficiencies back in in the time of Louis XIV. So there are many different uh, circumstances, many different viewing angles, so to speak, about engineering. And I like to think that engineers are dual citizens in the world of disasters and blessings, simultaneously using the tools of wonder and worst case scenarios. Anything that engineering produces can and does affect people in the best or the worst possible scenarios. And I think bringing in the higher construct of uh, cultural responsibility is crucial. See, good science is peer-reviewed, but accountable engineering is reality refereed. And that's why failures are unforgiving in engineering. It becomes paramount to bring in ethics 
economics, environmental considerations into the core design of engineering. You mentioned the effect of culture there. How has growing up in India affected your outlook, particularly as you're now living and working in Washington? I was born in an Orthodox Hindu family in South India. My grandfather was a local village priest. I tried to help him out as a Sioux priest in the morning. So fairly traditional upbringing. My education was uh, on an assembly line because of the sheer competition my entry into engineering was basically like arranged marriage. It was only after years of uh, practice and getting into different uh, forms of experiences and advanced studies, I finally fell in love with uh, engineering, appreciating the broader possibilities and the responsibilities that come with What do you mean by forced marriage? Because you are the first engineer in your family's history. And that's, you know, from the number of engineers that I've interviewed for this podcast, that's often quite unusual. So many of the engineers have family members that shines a light on other aspects of engineering or the possibilities within the profession. India has a rich tradition of producing uh, a lot of engineers. So engineering, medicine and law are fairly common and engineering. And at uh, one point, I think in my 10th grade, I had to make a decision where I belong (laughs) professionally. That's why engineering sounded like a well-treaded path and uh, seemed like the way to go. And as arranged marriage is common in India, I too took the path of engineering to profoundly realize the value that comes with an engineering mindset to better engage with problems of all kinds. So has that background affected how you approach policy and and engineering now that you're living in the United States, or was it an easy switch to make? I'll give you one example to explain how local culture affects you. And I'm not talking about temporary cultural experiences, but uh, some of the, the foundational ones. Someone born in India, even some of the religious scriptures emphasize the notion of caretaking. That happens to be a big function of engineering that seldom gets discussed. Oftentimes, we focus on how engineering is able to produce dazzling innovations, which we are all grateful for. But it happens sometimes at the expense of forgetting the kind of the dull, diligent, and the mundane activities of engineering, specifically talking about maintenance in society, which is a cultural responsibility, relentlessly Producing new objects that may or may not be needed is a questionable act. That's why we need to simultaneously also think about some of the activities that are unseen and happen in a daily format. Oh, in fact, over 70% of engineers are in maintenance related duties that keep the world running. It is an underrecognized struggle. It relates to even I mean, the whole notion of inspiration and perspiration, right? Perspiration, which has so much connection to maintenance, even there's an acronym for the word sweat, sewer, water, electricity, and telecommunication. How do you ensure that systems such as those that are essential for our daily living, ultimately civilizational survival, get emphasized? There are aspects of this kind of caring and the caretaking that are available in the Hindu scriptures. Um, So there are a lot of uh, influences that can be brought in from the world of humanities and philosophy into the rich practice of uh, engineering that are seldom communicated to the broad audiences. And I'm interested in focusing on the things that are right in front of you, but others don't pay attention to. Now, both your books, Applied Minds and Making Better Choices, extend beyond the traditional discipline of engineering. And, you know, you've already discussed how the sort of mindset and incorporating the humanities and arts and creativity. Did your early study of systems engineering create this foundation for you about interdisciplinary thinking? Yes, I was very fortunate to have a a broad engineering education. I was simultaneously taking courses in civil engineering, mechanical engineering, electronics, electrical, computing, and eventually found a fascination in biomedical systems. I was also fortunate to be a junior engineer in a number of industries. One of my favorite uh, experiences was uh, building uh, a controller for a cooker that mixed 
the ingredients to produce chocolate. So literally a Charlie in the chocolate uh, factory moment. <laughs> um, but I think the background in systems engineering, in addition to uh, what I retrospectively can appreciate, uh, the value that it brought to me, the elements of structure, constraints, and trade-offs, but also the ability to what's called uh, transcending the levels of abstraction. Too often, we get too fixated on some of the specifics to the point that we lose sight of the overall system. How do you go about pinching and zooming on different functions of interest? What I'm trying to say is if you're designing an SUV, you want to not just focus on the technologies that are innate to the SUV, that are the propulsion, battery, radiator, alternator, you name it, but also really zoom out of that to look at the global carbon circulation and also at the same time go back to an extremely specific tool within the car, say controllers. At any point in time, how do you go up and down these levels of abstraction and you're able to aggregate those functions? Now, this is something that was explicitly taught in my training as a systems engineer that seems to have a lot of value beyond just the projects involving coordination and policy and behavior, but also for acts of daily living. And in that regard, I'm very fortunate to have had that education that still influences my thinking. Now, you wrote an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal in the early part of the pandemic that said that COVID recovery would come down to engineering. Do you still think that's true? It absolutely is, uh, because the recovery, as we are looking at, is subliminal and also as a confidence-boosting mechanism. There's not a switch that could be just turned off or on to just make the pandemic go away, but also really providing an architecture for uh, future preparedness efforts. With the systems engineering sensibility, we have an opportunity to rethink the notions of immunity, the notion of preparedness, and how we want to conduct ourselves going further, given the amount of politics personal preferences that creep in to even seemingly simple things that could uh, basically stanch the pandemic. Without engineering, we cannot imagine uh, telework. We cannot uh, imagine broadband or even this conversation that we are having right now. In a number of ways, the invisible public health systems made possible through engineering innovations and maintenance is something we need to be proud of, but also use some of those uh, successful elements to help guide our path forward to better prepare for future pandemics. I mean, this sounds like a perfect fit for your description of engineering as a profession, quote, with profound consequences. I'm sure you didn't necessarily have a pandemic in mind (laughs) when you uh, use that phrase. But what were you thinking about when you said that? I read a line some years ago a philosopher, Paul Virilio, who wrote uh, that when you invent the ship, you also invent the shipwreck. The point that's in that statement is technology can simultaneously produce luxuries and liabilities. How do you constantly live in this polarity (laughs) is the question. And I think in a number of ways, technology has uh, compressed time and space. And in a way, has also contributed to the pandemic that we are living through and also going to facilitate our rescue from it. Ultimately, it goes back to the point that you just raised. How do you better engage with such a consequential profession, not only as an actor in it, but also as a dependent on it? You have a blog called The Barefoot Engineer. First of all, where did that name come from? It goes back to my childhood. Um, I used to walk in our villages barefoot. So it is something that it just takes me back to my childhood uh, fascination. My experience is me being in contact with reality, so to speak, and you can see the engineering connection. And what appeals to you about blogging over, say, Twitter or YouTube or, or even TikTok? I've developed an uh, interest in writing short form pieces in recent years that allows me the opportunity to compress some complex concepts and also simultaneously write about a problem set or suggest certain ideas or concepts that are not being considered. The short form pieces are a helpful way for me to publicly think about what I am personally thinking. 
Where will you go next, do you think? Are you very comfortable, I was going to say thinking about thinking, but also being involved about policy and, and shaping the next generation, perhaps how people think about engineering in the future? Very fortunate to be in a position where what I write about is something that I can also practice for a living at work. So there is a seamless uh, connection between uh, my day job and my personal interests uh, in terms of uh, professional contributions. I foresee continuing uh, some of these crossover concepts, bringing them together, putting them out for public consumption while I improve my thinking about those subjects, or, and also continuing my narrative communication through long-form writing, notably narrative nonfiction books. That's how I foresee practicing engineering or articulating the importance and the consequences of engineering that we all need to be better engaged with. If there was one piece of advice to engineers about a project that they're working on, something to think about, something to keep in mind, what would it be? One such incident happened in my own life. A graduate school course, it was an elective that I had to take as a requirement, but uh, the subject that I chose was uh, completely offbeat for me, and that ended up changing my worldview. And I took a course on cultural evolution. And the perspectives that I learned from fellow students and the kinds of readings that I was doing completely changed my perception of engineering and the way I went about it. If you look at the core of how engineering develops in society, there are so many evolutionary concepts that can better explain that engineering and evolution have so much in common to bring in the kind of the systems engineering perspective into this. Mother nature takes on system as a unit of selection, very carefully varies and selects traits and the attributes and then the best practices from that evolve and uh, they get honed in practice. But the only difference between that way of uh, doing in nature and that way of doing in engineering is engineering is deadline driven goal oriented so therein comes the constraints and of course natural constraints are completely different than technical constraints i think there are a lot of synergies in bringing in evolutionary approaches to engineering which could better enable us to take on some of the complex wicked civic issues that we have uh, been under engaged in the advice to an engineering student or a young professional, even a practicing engineer, is to try and get into a subject that you would normally not get into. That will create an experience that uh, you would not have planned for. In my case, it turned out to be profoundly beneficial. Guru Madhavan, thank you so much for joining me on the Create the Future podcast. Find out more about the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering by following QE Prize on Twitter and Instagram or visit qeprize.org. Thanks for listening and join me again next time.